So it was very exciting last week. We were able to have the first nature camp that's taken place in several years at Chapultepec at uh, uh, Jenna and Jimmy's farm. It was one of uh, Jenna's uh, really deep wishes that it be um, uh, resuscitated. And it took place last week thanks to uh, the camps at St. James Episcopal School and others. Uh, and it was a huge success. It was wonderful. And at the end of the week, they gave each one of the campers an award. And Laura Lee got most compassionate. And she immediately said uh, to Anna, who picked her up, Dad's going to be so proud. You know? And she called up and she said, I got most compassionate. Uh, but it definitely made me think, when do we stop getting rewards like that? You know, we get most sales or a uh, teacher with the highest SOL scores or most published professor or... Uh, largest congregation, or, you know, we get honored in different ways, but when was the last time we were recognized for our compassion? Which also begs the question, what yardsticks or movements push us in particular directions? What are our guiding momentum inducers? Is it success? Is it popularity? Is it power? Is it wealth? Or is it compassion and goodness uh, and connections? And I think we are unaware of the things that influence us. Uh, we certainly know, know they exist, uh, but the effect that they have uh, uh, and, and whether or not we are affected by them when we look in the mirror uh, is probably beyond our whole knowing. Am I tall enough? Do I have enough hair on top of my head? Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, Am I successful enough? Have I, have I brought in enough uh, revenue? Uh, is my car shiny enough? Do I live in the right neighborhood? All of these things have pressure on us, even though we know deep down we're a beloved child of God and we have everything that we need. I think the first lesson is a reminder about the yardsticks that we set. God's chosen people have a unique relationship with God uh, that is incredible. And God promised them this promised land, this place where they could be free from slavery, where they could be their own people, uh, and he would be in the midst of them. And he delivered. God delivered on his promise, and the people said, this is fantastic. Except that great nation has a big, mighty king. And so does that nation. And that nation's got a great standing army. And that nation has this. And that nation has that. We want to be like that nation. Where's our king? God says you don't need a king. Stop measuring yourself against that yardstick. It will do you no good. Here's what it will cost you. You will give a good bit of your hard-earned money uh, for taxes to pay for the king's court. You will give a whole lot of your crops so the king is never even close to hungry at all and neither is any of his court. Your daughters will be part of his concubine and your sons uh, will be his foot soldiers and his servants and you don't need it. I am with you and I will watch over you. And what do they say? They have a king. We'll choose that. And so God washes his hands and says, sure. Try it out. See how it fits. And so they go and they, they, they pick a king, uh, and they pick the most compassionate, the wisest, uh, the one who helped them during those difficult times to make, to make good decisions for the whole. No, they find the biggest, strongest, most strapping guy they can. And they say, that's going to be a good king. That's going to be our guy. And they king him. And we'll see in the next few uh, Sundays how that works out for them. But we do that. We are influenced by things that we don't realize have a compelling power on us. One of those is family. I have a dear friend, and when we lived in Louisville, uh, we were often driving together, uh, and every time we were heading to a particular area, uh, he would circle around his old neighborhood where he grew up. And he grew up in probably the most prominent subdivision uh, in the Louis greater Louisville area, uh, and he'd drive by all the huge houses, and, uh, and he'd start to wax about uh, his childhood um, and he started telling me something that really uh, made me think because it's so different than my childhood. Uh, he said, you know, and he lived in the right neighborhood and he went to the country day, the right school, uh, and he said, you know, I was raised uh, with the constant fear of embarrassing my family, of upsetting my family name. 
said, every time I walked out the door, I felt like one of my parents said, be careful, whatever you do, don't mess up the family name. Now, I moved around 20 times, so I never had that. I never lived in a place where I was a known entity. Uh, but he said it was a pervasive thought uh, and, and, and awareness that whatever he did, he carried his family name like a jersey uh, with the name on the back of, uh, uh, of his back. Uh, he went out into the world and did that, uh, and, uh, and he was fully conscious of it. Uh, but then one day, his world came kind of crashing down in reverse. Uh, instead of embarrassing his family name, uh, his father, who made it, made it big as a developer, um, uh, he was uh, uh, working with several other developers, and what they would do is they would decide who would get each bid, uh, and the, the, the other three would prop it up, uh, and then uh, the other one would be the low bid, and then they'd do the same for another project and the same for another uh, until they got caught. Uh, and it was the front page of the paper. And he opened it up, and he saw his family name on the front page of the paper uh, as his father went to jail. And then he saw as his mom, dealing with the shame and embarrassment of it, ended up uh, having a breakdown and having to go uh, uh, to the Our Lady of Peace uh, uh, for treatment. And he realized that his family name was shattered. The neighborhood in which he lived uh, was affected. All the things that he set as his yardsticks were turned upside down. Who was he? Where did he belong? What was his name worth? Jesus' family is going through kind of a similar thing. Uh, I cannot imagine 2,000 years ago, amidst a shame culture uh, in a very small town, having your son uh, be an embarrassment. Your son is preaching the most radical things everywhere they turn. Uh, they can't go anymore. They can't go to the market without people saying, get your son under control. Do you know what he's saying? They can't go to church anymore because the religious leaders have had enough of them. They're trying to calm them down and say, Jesus, just stay inside the house. Just calm down. You're embarrassing us. But it's far worse than that. Their identity, their name is being smeared all over town. How do we identify ourselves? What gives us value? So Jesus begins to say, says, I have a family that's beyond this family. I have a name that is beyond uh, the name that, that I've been given by my family. I have an identity, and each one of you can have a family and an identity and a truth and a measuring stick that is beyond what you've limited for yourself. You can be valued by how much you do God's work, by how fully you love, but you can get most compassionate awards for the rest of your life. And you can always know that you are a beloved child, a beloved brother, a beloved sister, that you are part of family. That when we come together as the body of Christ, we are one. Wherever we come from, uh, wherever we fall short outside, when we come inside these doors, we are one. We don't evaluate each other by what we drove here in, by what we're going to go home to. We come shoulder to shoulder at the Eucharist, and we say we're one as we receive from the one God who gave himself for us as an offering, as a love sacrifice. And we have value, and we don't need any other measuring stick. One of the beautiful stories that Bishop Curry told about the Eucharist and about uh, uh, the church was about these two people in the 1940s. They were both African-American, and one had joined the Episcopal Church the year before and uh, was dating uh, a, a gentleman from the Baptist Church. In fact, he was a licensed preacher in the Baptist Church. Uh, and he came to church with her, not sure what to expect. He'd never been in an Episcopal Church. And when he got there, he realized that he and his uh, significant other were the only two people of color in the entire church. Uh, and he was more than uncomfortable. And they did all the things that we do as an Episcopal Church, all of the different movements, which were somewhat foreign to him. Uh, but he watched patiently, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, his girlfriend uh, gets up and starts walking to the altar, and uh, he's frozen. He's sitting still in his seat, uh, but he's watching the whole thing take place. And in the 1940s, he watches this take place as they all go, and they kneel uh, at the altar rail with their hands extended, uh, and at that point, it was just the priest who gave out uh, the bread uh, and the wine. 
And so the priest would come by and uh, at each extended hand would put the wafer there and then uh, came back again with the wine and would, would give the blood of Christ shed for you uh, and turn it and give it to everybody. And he saw as he went by um, uh, every person and then to his girlfriend. And without so much as a pause, did the exact same thing. The blood of Christ is shed for you. And he said, they can't even drink out of the same water fountain. Yet in this space, they're brothers and sisters. They're children of God. There's no other measuring stick. They're family. I was writing uh, with a quarterly newsletter before I realized what the reading was going to be about, and I wrote this. I have been struck recently by how small my world can become, and it troubles me. Why do the relatively insignificant disappointments and tribulations of my children preoccupy my waking hours and even interrupt my sleeping ones? Why can I not recall tossing and turning in my bed over the children who have known nothing but a refugee camp or war or hunger or illness or homelessness or drugs or violence? Obviously, I know I have the capacity to ache and not just ache, but to be willing to move mountains for someone. How can I harness that love, that relentless desire to fix or to console or to remove obstacles or, or even better yet, to equip them to ascend beyond them? How do I channel that power? I believe it starts by fully engaging in the life of the church and fully connecting with the brothers and sisters to your left and to your right, coming up here and proclaiming that we are one and taking that one to Haiti, uh, to First Baptist, uh, to the food pantry, to uh, Uganda, you name it. But starting by realizing that we are family, not by blood, but by a blood poured out for us. One of the great things we celebrate today in Selden's ordination is that we have been with Selden in April. We've watched Selden grow up. Uh, we've been there as, as, as they got married. Uh, we've watched them together uh, claim this call. We've helped them discern this call. We've prayed for them and supported them throughout seminary. We've wept for them during difficult times. We celebrated when, uh, uh, when they graduated and, and during the, their ordination yesterday, and we will be with them uh, because this is our son and daughter, our brother and sister. It is our child. It is our companion. It is our family. And when we extend that farther and farther, we become more the people that we're made to be, and our yardsticks become closer to how much are we the family of God that we're called to be. Amen.